Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode where I'm continuing along our journey, deep diving into anxiety. Today, I'm talking about how we can make the brain more resistant to anxiety. This is a multi-part series because there's so many pieces and I can't even get into all the depth that I would love to. Uh, But today, specifically, I want to talk about the role of exercise when we're looking at that fear extinction. So last time I talked about fear extinction, which is really important to rewire the brain. So make sure you do check that out if you haven't already. But just a little recap, fear extinction, it's essentially retraining the brain. So rewiring it, retraining it to not be so reactive, not to be so trigger happy all the time and to be able to respond to stress and worries and fears and whatever thoughts are coming up, whatever the amygdala, those conspiracy stories, the amygdala is trying to throw at us, we're able to respond to them in helpful ways. So we do know that fear extinction, it doesn't erase memories, although we do know for children, maybe there's some evidence that the earlier intervention that we get for them, we might be able to erase some of those memories. So that's fantastic if we can unlearn some of them, but otherwise that fear response can come back. But there's lots of things that we can do to help maintain that success. I've already talked about mindfulness. That's a key piece to the puzzle, not awareness, but exercise is another piece as well. Researchers have actually shown that exercise during fear extinction, that can improve the acquisition and consolidation of fear extinction. So it's helping that memory store become stronger. So it's able to take in that learning. So remember, it's helping boost that dopamine that it that exercise is just making the brain work positively to be able to learn, hey, wait a second, this actually isn't that scary, and it's going to lay down new memories. And so that's really important. And so the thicker those memories become, and the more uh, you know we're learning, and, and the stronger we're able to pull and consolidate those memories from that fear extinction, we're going to reduce that relapse. And so it could even just be bouts short bouts of exercise that really promote that success of any exposure therapy that we do. And really exercise seems to have the biggest impact on fear relapse. So exercise is a huge piece to this puzzle. So let's really dig deep into this. That's why it's, we're deep diving into practice here. So it might be good to get into the science of it a little bit, hopefully not too much to bore you, but, but a little bit is going to be important. So we know that exercise, it enhances cognition, it enhances learning, it enhances our memory processes in general. So we know that's all really important for fear extinction and is something I'm going to talk about a little later as well, but in bonus, there's so many physiological and neurobiological things that are happening from exercise, lots of benefits. We know that physical activity it's just anti-anxiety. It's, it has an anti-anxiety, antidepressant sort of effect, and it's improved with physical health. I mean, weight loss, obviously, blood pressure, just overall life satisfaction. There's lots of benefits physically. I won't get into that with little side effects. We know all of those things. Um, anxious and depressive symptoms, they're way lower for those who regulate regularly exercise compared to people who are inactive. So really, I mean, there's a direct relationship between being inactive and not just anxiety, but also other psychological disorders. They kind of go hand in hand. So we know that exercise is really helpful, especially regular exercise that helps reduce feelings of anxiety, even just 30 minutes a day or more ideally, but even just 30 minutes a day of just walking, cycling, even something like that is helpful doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, doesn't matter anything about your gender, just having that 30 minutes of day is really important. High intensity exercise is definitely better. It has more effective, um, positive outcomes and side effects than low intensity exercise, especially when we're looking at long-term memory and long-term improvement in anxiety levels. The problem with the high intensity though, is that a lot of people drop out compared to the low intensity training. So really anything at this point is going to be really helpful. But I do know for me, you know, if I do a high hit exercise, high intensity interval exercise, I have a way better day. Even just my ADHD is way better, (laughs) way more under control because my prefrontal cortex is working way better than when I don't exercise. My girls know right away by nine o'clock, mom, you haven't exercised yet. Have you? It doesn't matter if I take my meds or not. Like mom, you haven't worked out. way more irritable. It's just a whole change in the demeanor. So 
we just really need to ensure that exercise is carefully individualized because I don't want to say go out and do shanti, high intensity interval training, plyometrics or anything like that. If you're only going to do it for five minutes and then drop out. Right. And for kids that that's a lot too. So we want to make sure that they're feeling successful, that they're bought in, that they want to do it, that they're motivated. So it's really got to be individualized to them. Then we're going to maximize the benefit from exercise while minimizing the risk of dropout. So it's really that balance. And if they're feeling stressed out as they're working out, counterproductive. We don't want that to happen. So with anything, you know, we just want to make sure that we're doing things. And there is some evidence too, you know, if we look at joggers versus walkers, there is some contradictory evidence out there. Like some people will say jogging obviously is way better. It's way higher intensity. It gets your heart rate up and all these things, but there are some researchers out there who would say, you know what? the reduction in anxiety is identical between joggers and walkers. So even just 30 minutes of walking, is really important. Generally though, we do find exercising, you know, 70 to 90% of the maximum heart rate for 20 minutes, three times a week. That's kind of the significant level where we see huge reductions in anxiety sensitivity specifically. So that anxiety sensitivity is the physiological pieces, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, but when we look at those symptoms, we know the symptoms of anxiety improve after even just acute episode, a short bout of physical activity, as well as routine activity. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes as well, because I think that that's important for us to think about. Now, some researchers, they initially suggested that the benefit of exercise was most helpful for adults compared to teens, but there's way more evidence showing that exercise during that adolescent period is so important. It really does help reduce anxiety and depression, and it helps lower the risk of it continuing into adulthood. I mean, those teenage years, it's such a critical window for brain and behavior development. I got to do a whole episode or a few episodes just on the teenage brain. But when we look at that, that regular exercise, you know, people who engage in exercise regularly, it really helps normalize that functioning of the important structures in the brain that I've talked about, like the prefrontal cortex, which is important for learning and saying, Hey, boy, wait a second. I'm glad not a big deal. So exercise helps with all of that. And it reduces any problematic markers that are in the brain. And it can really positively affect oxytocin, which helps us connect. And we feel lovey and, you know, we want to connect with other people and all of its receptors in the brain. So there's lots of good things about exercise. So getting started early, setting up those healthy habits now in the first place in childhood and adolescence is so important. So it doesn't matter what the research says at the end of the day, because we know in adulthood, if they don't have an active lifestyle through childhood, teenage years, it's a lot harder when they're adults. So we just got to start now because so many people, they're not the best sticking at regular exercise regimes. So the earlier we can help our kids get active. And this is just part of who we are and just part of life. That's the better. I mean, I work out every single morning. People are always like, how do you stick with it? You're so good for all of these years. I just don't know any better. Because by the time I was eight years old, I was working out consistently every single morning before I went to school, eight years old. So I was in grade four. I was up with my mom doing Charlene Prickett every day when I was in elementary. And then by high school, I would left early with her. She'd leave at 530 to go to work and I'd go with her and I'd go and work out at the gym before my classes started. And so then in university, that was just a thing. That's just always what I did. Isn't this what everybody does? Like I literally, that's how I grew up. Isn't this what everybody does? So it was so entrenched and it wasn't a chore as an adult. It was just like brushing my teeth. This is something that I do every, don't you brush your teeth every day? So that's why we want to start. And we do know that there's so many benefits and long-term exercise that definitely has that antidepressant effect. So it's so important. It can help improve sleep, which we know is essential for managing anxiety, right? And it affects our quality of life and our relationships, our irritability, our ability to learn. But unfortunately, most people with anxiety, you know, their sleep is disrupted and sleep is definitely problematic in those teenage years. And and as they get into young adulthood, because they're just not getting enough sleep most of the time. And they are very irregular with their sleep wake patterns because they're often starting to stay out late, right? Maybe on the weekends, they're sleeping in all day. 
And then that anxiety, I mean, the sleep is a big problem. Anxiety accounts for most of the variability in their sleep at the end of the day. That's what's affecting a huge part of their sleep quality, but exercise that improves the worry symptoms. It improves everything that's getting affected into their sleep. And we see the severity of anxiety, all the signs and symptoms that are associated with disturbed, disturbed sleep specifically. So tension, depression, low energy, fatigue, irritability, pain, inattention, all of those things that I've talked about, even just a little bit short term of exercise that can really improve sleep disturbance. So it's easier to fall asleep. It's easier to stay asleep and less time just staying awake in bed. So we see this continuous restful sleep and guess what? When there's continuous restful sleep, there's a normalization in sleep patterns. I won't go too much more into sleep because we've already talked about the importance of sleep, but exercise definitely helps with that. When it comes to anxiety, we want to rewire the brain and physical activity. It certainly does that. I've talked about what happens in the brain with anxiety in previous episodes. I think it was 15 through 18, I had said. So if you didn't listen to them, definitely go back and do that. But we do see these structural changes in the brain. Um, when, when we've got an anxious kiddo. And so one of the areas that we see is smaller, it doesn't develop as, as fully. It's definitely smaller. And the anxious brain is the hippocampus. And like I said, that's responsible for memory, which is important for learning new safety stories. And it's a huge piece of the anxiety and why anxiety is always coming back. So there's these different molecular mechanisms that help improve the functioning of our hippocampus. So there's B endorphins, there's brain derived neurotrophic sort of factors, serotonin. I mean, there's so many different things. All of those increase with exercise. We also know that exercise helps with the working memory piece, which is really important for learning because the dopamine and other things too, like norepinephrine, those all promote our ability to control what we pay attention to in the first place. And remember, anxiety wants us to narrow in and pay attention to danger, 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 danger. And we're not getting all of the information that we need to be able to make a rational response, to respond in rational ways. And so all of these things that exercise does helps us see the bigger picture. And that helps reduce anxiety because we can focus on the task at hand versus our worries, what we're doing in the moment now, mindfulness. That's what we need. There's other changes too: hormones, right? Hormones are changing all of those types of things that help promote positive mood with exercise. So serotonin, I've already talked about five HTP. Those are just two examples, but it also helps regulate stress. It helps with self-concept and self-efficacy. We feel better about ourselves. You know, we feel more confident. We, we, we develop this, I can handle anything attitude. That's really important for anxiety because anxiety is essentially saying, I can't handle this. So especially for kiddos who find um, the physiological effects of exercise, you know, we got to look at that as well. Um, that can be really anxiety provoking. You know, I do have a lot of clients who are so worried about elevating their heart rate. For example, I've talked about my one guy who has to sit down when his heart rate gets to 120. So physical training, I mean, it's just so stressful, but it can actually help increase their tolerance to those symptoms, realizing, Hey, my heartbeat has to increase when I go up the stairs and being able to see, Hey, this is actually the exact same feeling as when I'm really stressed out when I have to go talk to a girl, for example, they're saying, oh, wow, this feels the same way. But guess what? When I have to go talk to a girl, it feels like a heart attack because it's my interpretation of what's happening in my body versus when I'm working out, I know my heart's supposed to be racing like this. So that's another piece where mindfulness comes in, but exercise can actually help improve that tolerance to those symptoms. And so when our tolerance is improving to what's happening in the body, that's our anxiety sensitivity that reduces because now we're not so anxious about the physical symptoms of anxiety. There's also, I mean, there's just so much research out there for the effectiveness of anxiety and exercise, you know, um, I mean, there's lots of effective therapies, but exercise is just as effective as therapies. It's just as effective as medication, and it actually can help reduce any medication dependency. Now, unfortunately, I've already kind of touched on this, you know, exercise isn't always stuck 
with. <laughs> um, so that's definitely a barrier to overcome. It's rarely prescribed. I don't think people are really prescribed exercise. And if they are, it's a big eye roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what I'm supposed to do. But like with anything, you know, we need our brain to consciously think of the reward value. Teach our brain exercise is awesome. It's funny. I just had an injury um, fairly recently where I was working out and I smashed, I was doing a clean press. So I had a really heavy weight and I, I had to bring it up and I jump as I bring it up to be able to flip it and push it up to do a press. And when I came up with my jump, with my really heavy barbell, I smashed my face. Um, and I was worried I'd have to get dental surgery. It's still quite tender. And people are like, see, exercise is dangerous. The first opportunity so many of my friends have to jump on how bad exercise is. So that's not a good thing. But we, they, their brain doesn't see the value of exercise. My brain has seen it. My children have seen how good it is for me. They got to learn it for themselves too. But that's what we got to do is consciously teach our brain look at how good this is. Look at how good I feel not ruminating and avoiding. That doesn't make me feel good at all. Just think of a time where you were feeling exhilarated. Maybe you had a great walk or a great run, or you did something physical and that expansion that you feel, we got to tap into that and remind our brain, see, this is what we want. Exercise, it also gives us time out from any anxious rumination. I don't know about you, but when I'm doing my plyo training, jump training, I'm not worried about nothing. I'm so focused on what I'm doing and doing. Can I do 10 more? Can I do one more? Just three more, right? Or whatever it is. You're so focused on that. And we're really able to think about more positive sort of uplifting things. And we're more mindful. We're getting into the body. That's why I love yoga too. I can really focus on the stretch and feel the stretch and feel my body posture. We're really into our body. So if we're just conscious about that piece and we can really teach our brain So we're combining the mindfulness piece. That's really important here as well. Paying attention to how our body feels, how good we feel, how positive I feel, how happy I feel as we exercise that can really highlight the effects exercise is good. And then we can compare it way better than ruminating way better than eating a bag of cookies way better than whatever else I do to help manage anxiety. So we really want to be able to tap into that to be able to teach our brain consciously. Now I know we all consciously know how important exercise is. I know (laughs) I don't need to stress it too much, but there's always that emotional part of our brain. The amygdala is always going to trick us into excuses. I'm too tired. I just need to relax. I don't have time. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe another day, Monday, Monday, I'll start for sure. Monday, not this Monday, next Monday, I'll start. You know what? Year is almost over. It's the holidays. I'm just going to sail through. I'll start again. January one, January one comes. Oh, screw. Nobody likes, nobody keeps, what what are they called? Resolutions. Screw the resolutions. I don't do resolutions, right? There's just always something, one thing after another. So that's our amygdala trying to trick it because the amygdala doesn't want us Amygdala kind of knows exercise feels really good. And that's going to be bad because I'm not going to have so much control. So we just got to know it's another trick. Just do a quick 20 minutes. That could be so helpful with anxiety, even panic disorders. Doesn't matter how severe it is, just a quick 20 minute bout. So that brings me back to the point that I wanted to say earlier. I mean, there's still inconclusive evidence showing that exercise alone is necessarily effective in overcoming anxiety, um, but definitely has to be done. So it's necessary, but still not sufficient, but exercise helps promote all of the positive effects of everything else we do to help our anxious kiddos. So Yes, baby exercise on its own isn't enough. We still need to learn mindfulness. We still need to consciously rewire our brain and retrain our brain. You know, those discrepancies between old stories and new stories. There's a lot of those types of things that we need to do, but exercise is kind of that icing that holds it all together. Or maybe it's like an egg. It's a binding agent that helps solidify everything. So it's really a huge piece of adjunctive sort of treatment that we need to include. And that's really what I wanted to highlight for today's episode. So we can use that exercise to maximize the benefit of the work that we're already doing. And especially when we're doing fear extinction and exposure therapy. So we know that strategies to try to reduce anxiety during exposure are not helpful. 
So things like just breathe, right? Or use a safety behavior. Those things during exposure do not help. What we need to focus on are strategies that enhance learning. That's what exposure it's about. It's about learning new safety stories. So exercise is one of those strategies that we know really consolidates learning because of all of the effects it actually has in the brain. It's consolidating that. So we exercise, I mean, it suppresses amygdala activity that gives us more room for the prefrontal cortex to come in and learn, take in all the information and be able to make a rational response. And the hippocampus has to be online because that's our memory, because oftentimes it tries to prevent generalizing fear extinction. No, 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 no. I don't need any new memories. I've got the ones I need here. Thank you very much. But we know exercise, it helps promote the functioning of the hippocampus and the ability for it to rewire and to change. It also helps the overall executive functioning. That's a prerequisite for any effective cognitive restructuring. We have to have our prefrontal cortex online. So a key mechanism when we're looking at the sphere extinction, it's brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So BDNF, which I've kind of already talked about. I won't get too technical into this, but it really it's important to talk about because it's a huge modulator of synaptic plasticity, and it really plays a role in our hippocampus long-term in specifically the potentiation and the learning. And so essentially what that means is it really helps with the fear extinction (laughs) of whatever fear that we've got, right? So that we need strategies to enhance that learning, to enhance that BDNF so that it releases, you know, that BDNF is released to consolidate all of that extinction learning. And guess what? Exercise significantly increases that BDNF. and and all of that activity in the regions of the brain that's so important for fear extinction. So we see that exercise, it acts as this cognitive enhancer. It's manipulating the core mechanisms of exposure therapy and like synaptic plasticity, meaning we are rewiring the brain. Essentially all of that mumbo jumbo that I just talked about, exercise directly rewires the brain. And so the first thing that we can look at, I've kind of given you little nuggets, but we can look at the timing of the exercise in relation to the fear extinction learning. So I've talked about exercise, generally speaking, in everyday life, first thing in the morning is always good. 20 minutes a day is always good. But when we are using it in conjunction with the work that we're doing, so like exposure therapy, timing is important. So there's different phases. Fear extinction, there's two critical phases when we're looking at um, fear extinction learning. So the first phase is the acquisition phase. So that's the brain. It's, It's taking in information. It's learning that that initial association was not accurate. Hearing sweet Caroline on the radio does not cause accidents. (laughs) <laughs> okay. So that's an example of an association. Maybe someone was listening to sweet Caroline. They're into it. They were singing and they got into an accident. And so now they get tense every time they hear that action, that music. So there's no cause and effect. Our brain makes really ir- irrational associations. So we can learn. So the first phase of fear extinction is to learn, Hey, that's a dumb association. It doesn't actually cause accidents. So for, you know, if we're going to look at anything, you know, the dog doesn't attack me just because I looked at it in the eyes, nothing bad happened, right? So it's learning that that doesn't happen. The second phase is the consolidation phase. So that's where there's these molecular processes that are taking place in the neural circuits responsible for forming the long-term memory. And we want the long-term memory of fear extinction. And so the beauty of combining, you know, when we're looking at this with therapy is that we only need short bursts of acute exercise. So short bouts of exercise to help both the acquisition, the take again, the learning of the information and the consolidation of the long-term extinction learning. Exercise helps with both phases. So we see that now when we look at the timing, it's beneficial either immediately before or immediately after fear extinction for about 30 minutes. So that's really promoting that fear extinction memory. So that's really what we want to do is solidify that memory learning. Um, I mean, during can be helpful as well, especially when facing a fear, but exercising after exposure, that really seems to help the most with memory consolidation. 
but the same exercise done six hours after extinction. So if you have a session at 10 o'clock and you're not doing any exercise till six o'clock at night, there's really no consolidation. It, it, there's no effect on extinction memory retention. So it's really looking at that time right before and right after, which is ideal. So if we can incorporate that into our session somehow, or if you're taking your kiddo to therapy, maybe doing a 30 minute jog there, <laughs> doing some exposure therapy or having to do a 30 minute jog home can be really helpful. Um, so, so we want to make sure that it's really close together and that can help too, with some of the physiological responses but that's going to help solidify that learning. And, and we see that exercise, it helps with the generalization of extinction learning, which is really hard because, you know, little Albert, the example I always fall back on is he only had to learn to be scared of the rat, but became scared of lots of different things. But to unlearn it, he had to unlearn every different little thing because it just didn't generalize. Our brain just doesn't work that way. But exercise helped with the generalization of learning. and like I've already talked about, it reduces the relapse. So reduces the likelihood that we'll be anxious again in the future. So earlier I mentioned how the physiological effects of exercise can be anxiety provoking for some. And so exercise before exposure, that can really help with the deepening of that extinction because we're combining both internal and external cues. And so, you know, a really simple example of this is people who are scared of heights, they often misinterpret that internal cue of anxiety is threatening. <gasps> I'm going to fall. Something bad's going to happen. And it's, 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 they're, they're just those physiological feelings that are so automatic. It's just fueling that fear in the first place. And so we see that acute exercise in the moment and right before can actually help reduce that anxiety sensitivity. So, so they're not scared of those internal sensations of anxiety anymore. So that can be really helpful for some people who are reluctant to do things like go on a roller coaster, you know, the increased heart rate from exercising before can really reduce that reluctance of going. And it allows them to learn, you know, new non-catastrophic learning about those internal sensations. Oh, this actually feels good. It's the exact same thing when I'm scared to go talk to the girl, for example, but we're learning, Hey, this is actually a good thing. So we're being, they're able to see those associations and see right in the moment what's happening in the body is actually a good thing. It can be really beneficial. And, you know, the high intensity exercise can be really beneficial for people who, who are really anxious or it doesn't matter what level of anxiety, it can be really helpful that high intensity because exercising at that sufficient intensity and sufficient duration, they can adapt to the stress response so much better. And so they're adapting that stress response system that ultimately reduces their stress response to other stressors. So for example, over, um, you know, over time, if there's multiple bouts, for example, the, the response to exercise starts to normalize or habituate, which helps us Sent, desensitize to other stressors like anxiety provoking triggers or oh, my heart rates up. So now I'm, I'm just used to my heart rate being up. Hopefully I'm explaining that. I feel sometimes <laughs> I kind of go around in circles. If Definitely reach out if you have a, uh, any questions about any of that, but we see exercise just really helps reactivity to the psychological stressors, to the physiological stressors. So really exercise in itself can be a great exposure activity. And for my young man who couldn't get his heart rate up above 120, well, guess what we did? High intensity exercise to get his heart rate up to 180, even for him to see, wow, this actually feels fantastic. And look, Carolyn, I didn't have a heart attack. So really important. There's so many different pieces that we can look at now, exercise and mindfulness. They seem to be equally effective in reducing anxiety if we're looking at them separately, but exercise actually seems to be more helpful with more severe anxiety, helpful for everybody with anxiety. But if we're going to look between exercise and mindfulness with more severe anxiety, initially exercise is probably better. But here's the thing. If we combine both mindfulness and exercise with everything else we do, we've got a winning combination here. That's going to help improve the dopamine, the reward system in the brain. And we're going to start feeling better. We're going to be able to stay present with our awareness. And especially if we're going to be adding exercise, we can see how awesome exercise actually is. Not just the thought of, oh, 
exercise, right? So for those with severe anxiety, like I said, it might just be helpful to just add the exercise first, and then you can add in that mindfulness piece after, but we still want to use mindfulness. Um, and, and especially with kiddos, we want to help them recognize those worries creeping in. We want to use exercise in a very preventative way. And, you know, we can even just, they can use it for them, their self sort of treatment, you know, even just walking. I know, I think I've shared an example of my eldest daughter, by the time she was 18 months, she learned that I go to the pantry, I grab a bottle of water, I shake it and I walk and I do laps around our island. Right. And even just, you know, for a few minutes, if they can start doing that, that's a practical strategy where they can do that when anxiety starts to creep in, getting all of using all that adrenaline and, and energy that's going on in their body. So that's another great thing um, because it's getting ready with adrenaline, right? It's getting us ready to, to do those types of things. So it can be really helpful in that way. Before I sign off today, I thought I'd share just a few guidelines. I've kind of talked a little bit, but if you are going to focus on exercise, just generally broadly, obviously before exposure or right after exposure can be really helpful, but just generally speaking, kids and teens really should be getting an hour of physical activity every single day. Even if it's just walking fast, an hour of exercise is important. Adults an hour would be fantastic, but even just getting 30 minutes of accumulated, it, could, it doesn't have to be all at once. It could be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most days of the week is recommended. And when we look at the research as it relates to anxiety specifically, exercise should really be longer than 10 weeks to really be able to see anxiety reductions. So, so we want, again, at least 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week for more than 10 weeks, we usually see a huge reduction in anxiety. And this can be aerobic uh, activity, or it could be resistance training, it could be weight training too. So I think that that's really helpful just to kind of keep those guidelines in your head. Um, key principles to promote success when we're engaging in that regular physical activity, more activity, the better, obviously that's really helpful. Again, accumulated time is more important than the intensity, um, which is really interesting because, you know, even just this morning, I started a new training program and he's like, you know, it doesn't matter. It's only a 20 minute workout, but it doesn't matter how much time, as long as what you're doing with that time. So there are different theories, but in, the research anyway, they're looking at the accumulated time. It's more important than the intensity. And even, um, some research that I've looked at, even just, you know, a long, slow two hour walk can be really, if you look at the primal method sort of thing, that can be really helpful as well. Um, the other thing too, is lifestyle activities, you know, so looking at substituting walking or biking instead of driving using a push more rather than riding a lawnmower. Maybe there's little things like that. I mean, we've all heard those, you know, parking away further away from the doors um, can be really helpful. But if that's what's going to help sustain regular physical activity um, versus structured activity or going to the gym, then that's okay. Look, look for all of those ways that you can incorporate that. So I'm going to leave it there for today. There was a lot to think about. I do go into lots of detail about making the brain resistant to anxiety through mindfulness and exercise and everything that happens in that brain through the anxiety compass mastery and training program. So definitely check that out. If you'd like to dive deeper with me and work, work with me and consult on some of your own cases or your own kiddos that you're working with, but thank you for joining me today. Have a great day. Help those anxious kiddos be bold and courageous, and I'll see you next week.